that we actually need to extract ourselves. Can you just can you page. can you start can you start again with that? You said that Shakespeare brings the brings the human back to nature. Um, so the you know the old green world argument that in order to get away, in order to resolve. Um, the, the problems of human hierarchies and dynamics. You've got to get everyone into a forest and they have to lose their identities. And then once they return to a more visceral form, everything can be organized and then they can go back to the city to law and order with everything corrected. How, how um, is that, how is that, I'm sorry to interrupt you again, but how is that different from Milton? I mean, in Milton, there also is this sense that in order to go up, you have to go down. I mean, I, I know it's very simplistic to say that, and I think they are similar, but that's the same. Wouldn't wouldn't we put Dante in the same? Mm -hmm. Therefore, sure. the same. Sure. Yeah. And also, Mon Joseph and his brothers. I mean, that's yeah. Mon's almost primary argument is: in order for Joseph to go up, he has to go down and down and down and down and down and down. Right. Interesting. That's very interesting. Okay, I need to read that then. Oh, uh, it's a long one, but it's it's so rewarding. It's it's so rewarding. I, I'd like to share some things with you. I'll send some of the things, some of the passages that have really moved me the most. Um, I love you. But what were you what were you saying um, in relation uh, about about Shakespeare or about Milton having understood better than anyone the achievement of Shakespeare? Uh, I'm not sure he understood better. He understood first. I would like in the sense that he, just in a timeline thing. Mm. It, it, okay, obviously, and, and it's it, just on the, on, the, on the basic addressing the issue. I mean, um, Ben Johnson obviously writes his eulogy. Uh, and then no one really talks about Shakespeare very much. Mm -hmm. no, no one really cares, except Milton. Does. And it Milton, is odd in that, that Gary, whatever, is it a Gary Taylor book about right, the invention of Shakespeare? And it doesn't really happen until much later on. Meaning the yes. Shakespeare industry does not start until the later part of the 17th century at the earliest. But you're right, Milton notices and says so. Yeah, and is worried by it. It's, it's, it's a poem full of anxiety because it's also not a... I always look at that poem looking for a wonderful piece of writing by a great poet on another poet. Mm. But it doesn't say what I want it to say. Or it doesn't say what I'd want Milton, as far as I know Milton, to say about Shakespeare. It says something quite different and off theme and it's it's quite unsatisfactory as a poem in some ways mm. but it is very satisfactory as a kind of understanding that milton was grappling with a problem and i think the poem literally presents that problem which is shakespeare in milton's mind and um everyone else no one really bothered until i mean i suppose the proto-romantics started you know taking Shakespeare in order to react against the neoclassicists. But that would, again, that's a different issue. But, uh, but well, I just want to go back to I, uh, the way I read the tradition is that Milton is the wedge against neoclassicism, not Shakespeare. Milton is, Milton is. So I need to hear so much more about that because, because that's so interesting because that's literally how I'm now obsessed by reading Shakespeare. So. Well, I, well, I'll just tell you, let me give you an example of where I'm coming from, and then you can tell me a little bit, right? I mean, I've been working on Addison for a while, The Spectator, and, and Milton is this obvious presence there and really makes your argument entirely that he writes these essays in order to turn Milton into some kind of um, epic writer that Aristotle would approve of, right? And he keeps on saying, well, Milton does follow all these rules of epic, and he's clearly failing as he does this, right? And he needs not to he needs not to invent the word sublime, but you know I think John Dennis is also using the sublime at that at that time, but the sublime becomes the only way really to talk about Milton after neoclassicism fails. But to me, Milton is he represents all of the energy, and you can just the the, sh the shorthand would be enthusiasm, of the mid 17th century, that neoclassicists like Addison and Shaftesbury want to repress. They just want to push it off okay. and because Milton represents this political en energy and this theological energy, which is much too dangerous. And Addison's coffee house, the, conver the place for conversation, is the way you refine that um, enthusiasm into something that can be socialized. And, it's, and, 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 the, and the poetic and the political that I'm talking about in political or theological terms, it's the same in aesthetic terms. He's just too dangerous. You can't unleash him. His voice is too powerful. He's the, yeah, he's, yeah. I, how, how does that, 
how does that work with the uh, so how does that work with the with the politics and the science of the day because he was ex mm -hmm. he is extremely dangerous most i mean but he's also dangerous obviously theologically and um in the sense that another way of reading it would be that shakespeare came at a time of of great change let's define that later and milton still existed in that world and the world of the enlightenment that would follow mm. was 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 already being was already there in the background it was already growing and henry people... moore, henry moore was his tutor at cambridge right and moore is like the key figure in that transition i think meaning the, right. as a cambridge platonist meaning moore as one of the cambridge platonists is between the worlds of of Dunn, Milton, Shakespeare, and Descartes. I mean, that, that's how more, you know, and, 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 and he's trying to hold on. I think for me, that's why the Cambridge Platonists, um, the, these forgotten um, philosophers in, 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 in history, they're interesting because of their failure, meaning they're trying to accommodate an enlightenment into the perspective that they're inheriting from Milton and Shakespeare and Dunn. And they can't do it. They fail, meaning yeah. enlighten, in the, the voice of enlightenment is just much too powerful, and it really extinguishes that voice, except it manifests itself at different times in different places. I think Newton is one of the strange places it does manifest itself, because Newton really is, in some ways, part of that tradition, strangely, I mean, because of all his alchemical stuff. Whatever, that's another, that's another that's story. Right. That, yeah, that sets Newton apart, because I... You know, without oversimplifying it, it seems that Shakespeare and, 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 and Milton, we're still playing this game to a certain degree. Um, and uh, I mean, I think in the visual arts, obviously, there, there is a large, I mean, look, just seeing the movement from Raphael to Caravaggio or something, and you put the Caravaggio to me, you would put in the Shakespeare Milton bracket of things. And uh, why, why just translate that so I can understand the, how, how the visual is, is corresponding with the poetic? Uh, so, so, without using like it's horrible cliche terminology, but it looks at the natural world as something that is, a, I think, full of disorder and mm. um, that the human rational attempt to create order on that is okay. woefully placed. Okay, in the sense great. that artistically drawing golden mean pictures of um, Jesus and, and the Virgin Mary is to miss the whole point of the mystery of the religion that it's supposed to be representing. Um, and that Caravaggio, therefore when St. Paul is falling, everything is destabilized, everything is, you know, frankly from a modern point of view, it's weird, right? It has that feeling, and a lot of people have that feeling with Shakespeare sometimes, you know, this is weird. like what are these witches doing and like why is Hamlet just moping and modern productions keep on making this mistake of okay we're going to explain why Hamlet's like yeah. because otherwise the audience is going to get confused but the whole right. purpose is the confusion like the right then in that Ethan Hawke version have you seen that one which is entertaining yeah, for some I, reason I, yeah I was in, yeah, I he, he, he's wearing a, he's wearing a uh, a wire Right, right. So, or, or she's wearing a wire, so he finds out. Right, it's like, oh, you want to know why he goes crazy? This is it. Right? Okay, it's, yeah. Right. What? Give Which us, a, give me, an, give me an example of a Caravaggio that you're talking about. Uh, the one I'm thinking about a lot because it's um, close to what I was, uh, what I'm saying about Shakespeare's Pauline philosophy that underwrites the plays is the uh, just the conversion on the road to Damascus, and it's upside down. So St. Paul has fallen off his horse. Uh, but it's an. In I'm just trying to look at it. Oh wow! What a cool image. And even even on a technical level, for instance, Caravaggio didn't do drawings underneath. He just painted straight onto the canvas. So mm -hmm. even on on the basic technical level, he was just re rejecting the the rules of draftsmanship and you know in in that in in the way that i think very much when shakespeare i mean the problem with shakespeare is i don't think he's just he has his own inheritance i think you know i think marlow was doing it i think kid was doing it i don't think it's um but tell me about yeah. this painting again that now that i'm looking at it 
Right, so St. Paul is like, he's fallen off backwards and the light is coming up uh, from heaven. And obviously, so he's been struck by Jesus. But instead of an image of, this is the moment where God has touched him. But instead of him being uh, elevated, he's been literally thrown to the ground. And meanwhile, the old man in the top right-hand corner and everyone else. So there's a sense that in order to ascend, you have to be right. you're thrust. The images, in, in, in other words, before that, they would have had St. Paul standing in front of you or at least lying down. But he's, his head is towards you. Everything's the wrong way around relative to how he'd been drawn before. Uh-huh. Uh, very interesting. Uh, we were saying just about Joseph, you have to go down, right? Um, yeah. You know, uh, well, but there's, and there is this idea. Better, this better, is, my, better my heart, three-person God, right? The Dunn poem. Yeah. And, the, oh, and the, all of the paradoxes of Dunn, that actually the truth lies in the paradox, is also in Shakespeare, it's also in, um, in the in Mannerist and Baroque visual arts. Um, the, and, and, and the neoclassical idea that you can state that, I mean, you know, Ben Johnson writes characters that are, that are um, satirical objects, but not only does he do that, he then defines for the audience, the character, literally. Mm. He's defining it, 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 it's, he has an obsessive desire to control the, uh, the, the artistic sort of product, whereas Shakespeare's kind of the opposite. He's, he's attempting to make it as, as, as obscure as possible, which, mm. which is in, almost impossible to do because to be obscure and coherent is almost impossible. I mean, any, I can imagine any kind of like, you know, cool teenager who's got a guitar, he wants to riff. You know, the problem is, is it's he tough. to play guitar. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like people are great jazz legends are, Legends because they could play it in classical format as easily as they could play it. Pharaoh Sanders could play jazz standards when he wanted to. Yeah. And Sun Ra, I mean, the extreme example. And, and what's, who's um, not Thelonious, but the other guy, Bill Evans, of course, right. uh, a portmanteau of our names. Um, he was a great classical pianist, and that's what made him so good. You know, he took some heroin and then he became a great, great jazz. Uh, don't try that at home, Ed. Yeah, no, I don't think that will help my writing. <laughs> um, right. So um, that's so that's I interesting. In a, in, a way, in a way, in a way, you're saying that what I the way I read it is that that Shakespeare and Milton allow, and I, I'm just using Freud in the most metaphorical sense. They just allow for the unconscious. That's yeah. there. And it's and it's and it's an energy that is, is, is um, that is part of the human personality, and it's either it either informs the person human personality, and then you have a chance of being psychically healthy, like Rosalind, and as you like it, yeah. right? Because she goes yeah. into the forest and she becomes someone different because she can. But because as you said earlier, all the rules are released. You go into nature, right? the simple version. And then there are those who repress them. And, the, and, that, and that turns, it's bad, it's bad poetry. It's bad theology. It's bad everything. Yeah, and, and, and on that point, it's interesting on the psychic health of the characters, to what degree actually Shakespeare's females differ, differ on this front from his mm. males. Um, because what you said about Freud is, I mean, Freud having Freud having read Milton and Shakespeare enables himself to discover the, the, the to become the, Freud. Yeah, and but Freud also had certain views on women and men that might be explained because I can't imagine a male Rosalind in the sense that the male versions of Rosalind. So I, I think I think someone like Paul Staff or the Duke in Measure for Measure. Anyone that starts to try and organize the player that he's in as a man tends to be, uh, an, well, one would call them psychologically healthy in the way that Rosalind. Um, I, think Harold, I think Harold Bloom says that, that Hamlet is Rosalind's dysfunctional cousin. Yes, I can imagine that. Uh, yes, the, the cousin that Rosalind's a bit embarrassed by, but, you know, at, at, at family Easter has to be. <laughs> um, 
there's another thinking about Shakespeare's characters in that way is really good um, from Bloom. I don't know. I think it was Nuttall. Nuttall said that Hamlet, uh, Troilus and Cressida was the play that Hamlet wrote after having watched Hamlet. <laughs> what a great line! Yeah. So, so, um, right. I mean, I, I would. I, I. I still maintain that that Hamlet is that measure for measure the subject of which is religion is Shakespeare's most cynical play and Hamlet is his most theologic. I mean, we talked about this before Hamlet being his most theologically inspired play, whatever it's the, it's theology beyond theology. It's the, it's, it's, it's the, it's the breaking of every narrative and you're just left with, I mean, one there, there's a special providence in the fall of the sparrow, you know, that's what, that's what's left. Well, I think that the, one of the things that sets Shakespeare apart, even from Marlowe and, uh, Kid, uh, but uh, more obviously Johnson, and uh, I and it, it's a sort of, he, and it may be a sensibility that can only have come from not having gone to the universities and not having had this cynical relationship with religion. That mm. as a young man, his relationship with Christian liturgy and theolo and, and theology was wasn't. It, it didn't have all of the angst that Marlowe had. Or, or any of the superiority that Ben Johnson felt over the church. It, it has, so to me, Shakespeare brings in many of the most profound elements of uh, Pauline thinking as a result of having not been back. You know, it's, it's what one could say um, today about the, the academy. I mean, it, it, you know, very clever children can come out with very strange ideas because um, you know, there's an ideological milieu that Shakespeare in his day also avoided. He, he wasn't tainted by having gone to Cambridge. Because if he'd gone to Cambridge, <laughs> he would have thought, he would have ended up thinking, well, I don't care about St. Paul's letters. That's just pokerum and, and uh, you know. But as a young man, having allowed himself to develop, he had a much more rounded view of Western civilization than, than the neoclassical synod. And that's what, I mean, Marlowe is amazing, but he ends up writing diabolical characters um, out of a kind of cynicism and a willful cynicism that actually doesn't suit him. I, actually, Marlowe would have done quite well believing in 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 in, in things a little more. He may have, <laughs> That's a good. You really you're like you're like a literary critic from the 1950s. You just got all these great, very you know, very succulent um, one-liners. You can't do that as an academic anymore. That's a great line. He would have done much better as a believer. I just, you know, I mean, but that's also because I see everything now through the uh, lens of. I would like to say Shakespeare, but basically Hamlet. <laughs> so tell, so so tell me more about that. So I'll tell you how it's going. It's going well. I've finished the introduction. I've basically finished chapter one. Basically finished chapter two. So chapter three and the conclusion, and then I'll go over the whole.